Today I'm I'm speaking with Dan Blondell, the CEO of Nano One, a tech a Canadian technology company in, in the battery space. How are you, Dan? I'm great. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Good, um, Dan. I, I've heard quite a bit about your about your company, and I'm I'm fascinated by the fact that you're a technology company because uh, this this is what we really need to do. We we need to look downstream from raw materials. We've got to, and and so what I'm finding is that Canadian companies have spent too much time in with just the raw material aspect of, of high technology. And and they've they've got to go downstream in technology and you're an outstanding example of of the right way to do it, I, I think. Uh, I've, I've heard a lot, but I'd like you to tell us about, uh, we, in a previous discussion you and I had, you you said, well, you know, I, I don't want to talk too much about cathodes, it's complicated. I, I disagree. What, I, I, what I'd like to avoid is talking about the chemistry of, of making cathodes, but I certainly want to talk about cathodes. What is the advantage of the processes you've developed for making uh, the cathode of lithium ion batteries versus the current technologies that are widely used, especially in Asia today? Well, so cathode manufacturing, without getting into the details of the chemistry, is about taking sources of, of lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt, iron, phosphorus, and combining them into a mixed metal oxide. Basically, it's just a, it's a ceramic powder. Um, and, that, mm -hmm. and one of the little kernels of powder is, uh, is a, a composite crystal structured material that has uh, layers of lithium and nickel and manganese and cobalt that allow you to charge and discharge. Just, I just wanted to give your listeners a bit of context on what the cathode is. Okay. Um, what we do differently um, at Nano One is we've, de we've developed a way to make these materials. We haven't changed the formulation of the material, uh, uh, but we have changed how we make the underlying crystals. And it's the, the formation of those crystals and uh, the, the raw materials that we choose to put in there, which help reduce the cost, the number of steps we use, which are far less than the, the number of steps industry uses. In fact, we, we eliminate middlemen and, and often a, a completely um, uh, uh, another step of, of, of coating the material. So we eliminate a precursor of, of taking nickel, manganese, and cobalt, uh, making those before you add the lithium. So we add everything together. Coatings included. We eliminate a bunch of steps, so there's a manufacturing advantage. But then on top of that, the crystal structures that come out of our process are highly and uh, purified crystal structures that uh, are less susceptible to cracking and degradation mechanisms when you assemble them into a battery and when you cycle the battery, when you're charging and discharging the battery. So we're shooting to improve the longevity of those materials, the durability, and at the end of the day. Uh, by doing that, we're enabling uh, electric vehicle manufacturers and battery producers to make a longer lasting and uh, a bigger, a longer range battery for electric vehicles. I understand that you, you, you're, uh, you've gotten uh, manufacturing customers, let's say, and in particular, a large uh, Chinese uh, battery maker is, is working with your technology now. Is, is that correct? That is correct. Yes. So, so uh, Puli Technology is mm -hmm. a, is a cathode producer. So uh, actually, they're also a lithium producer. So they they have a lithium okay. and, and yeah. they refine lithium in, in China. And then they actually also make cathode materials. They they make uh, lithium cobalt oxide uh, that goes into uh, let's say Apple products and iPhone products. And they are actually a supplier, uh, you know, a sub supplier to to those uh, products. And they also make lithium iron phosphate, which is the key uh, uh, material that goes into uh, uh, battery for electric buses, industrial applications, and uh, applications like that. So uh, we are now effectively working with them to design a next generation manufacturing facility for the production of lithium iron phosphate. And, and together we're going after a large chunk of that market. And, and where, where would that be, that facility? Well, ground zero for, for lithium iron phosphate is China right now. Right. And, and 
when we, and we know that's going to expand into India. Uh, we're going to see that in emerging markets like South America, and and eventually as electric buses and everything filter into the Western world, we'll see those happen as well. But by and large, the manufacturing will start in China. Um, but we, we have great ambitions to bring it to Canada as well. Uh, there's a long history of making lithium iron phosphate in Quebec, and uh, and it's still there. And we believe we can drive that cost probably in half uh, in terms of what they do in, in, in Quebec. And we can revitalize that market and, and potentially prevent stranded assets in that area. I, I note that the Chinese uh, buses and, and vehicles of that type, like uh, urban transportation tend to use lithium iron phosphate batteries uh, rather than the much more expensive types containing a lot of cobalt and, and nickel and, and manganese. And, and I'm wondering, do you think there's a market in Canada or in the U.S. for this type of battery for vehicles? Ah, it's a very good question. A lot of it depends on, on driving habits. And so in North America, mm -hmm. uh, we tend to buy vehicles uh, and, and electric vehicles or any kind of vehicle, uh, we tend to buy them for the uh, for the worst use case. So that would be, work, you know, once a year we're going to drive a really long distance or once a month we're going to go to the cab. So, uh, so electric vehicles, people are tending to buy them with these large battery packs. Mm -hmm. in, China, in China, what we're seeing is that, um, a big part of the entry-level driving market is buying $10,000 vehicles powered with LFP. They go 150 kilometer range, which frankly would serve most of our needs, except that we don't tend to buy cars like that in the West. But they are buying cars like that in China. I think that kind of mentality will change as the demographics and the next generation of drivers comes up. So we'll see that emerging in, in uh, uh, certainly in North America. I think with, with um, uh, technologies like, like autonomous driving, um, range anxiety goes away completely because you don't own the car, someone else does, and it's like getting a taxi. Um, in cases like that, then the, the industrial efficiency of lithium iron phosphate, it's, it's the safest, it's the least likely to catch fire, it's the longest lasting, it's got the best total cost of ownership, and, and basically the security of supply is relatively high because uh, iron and phosphorus are, are abundantly available around the world. So I, I think that uh, those the LFP has a very, very strong future um, in uh, as the whole electric mobility uh, um, theme takes off and rolls out um, uh, across the world. I think you're absolutely right. And what I've noticed is that as uh, the uh, bus market has opened up here to, to electric buses, in California in particular, they're all lithium iron phosphate. And we're not hearing anything about that because it doesn't fit the narrative of the car guys. They don't want to talk about that. Well, it, it, yeah, it doesn't fit the narrative of the car guys. And, and, and frankly, you know, long-range luxury electric vehicles, are, are it's, it's a big market right now. And, and all of that's going to NMC. And, and we have uh, some very, very active work in that, including our mm -hmm. Volkswagen and, and our whole single crystal technology that I mentioned before is a big part of that. But um, lithium iron phosphate, to come back to it, is the safest material. It's, it, mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't go into thermal run anyway to well over 600 degrees. If you're going to put a, a battery in a bus, um, uh, you want to make sure that it's going to be extremely safe. And I think that's one of the overriding mechanisms. The other thing is you can get 10,000 cycles out of it. And so those batteries, uh, you put them in the bus, you're going to fully deplete them every day, and you're going to, and you're going to charge them back up. It's going to last, you know, five, eight years uh, before it gets replaced. And that simply won't work with the cobalt-based materials. They just don't have that kind of longevity yet. Um, we're working on improving that, uh, but uh, there's nothing commercially out there. Okay, I, I think you're on. I really think you're on the right track, and I've I've always wondered why uh, there's so much chatter about the long range batteries, which are expensive and uh, don't have the cycle life, uh, as a, as against lithium iron phosphate, which I think the Chinese have proved is a very good technology since they've made so many vehicles with them. And it's interesting, one thing you said that, that struck me, we, we are addicted in the United States of, you know, I think I'll go to Chicago this weekend. That's quite a drive. And we certainly don't want to run out of fuel. But in fact, urban driving is what we mostly do. And that is really short range. Yes. So I, I do think that the, the people's car, the car that the average person, if they're going to drive themselves, 
is, is can use a lithium iron phosphate battery. You don't have to worry about long range. And I think you're absolutely right about uh, autonomous vehicles and, and the Uber Lyft phenomenon because those cars can be charged anytime they're not they're not in actual use because they'll they'll be at central stations they go out from there to pick you up when you call and so they'll be charging all the time and what holds back that phenomenon in the expensive cars is that the cycle life you don't want to waste the cycle life charging it all the time but the lithium iron phosphate lends itself like uh, just like a, a cell phone you keep it plugged in all the time what difference does it make and i think i think that's the real future of electric transportation at least in north america uh, so i think you're on the right track yeah i think the long distance driving thing is a challenge in north america because because we don't we're not able to put the sort of high speed train network like china right. can a little bit of right and, right you know that just shaves off all of that long distance driving. It's way nicer to get on a train and go those distances mm-hmm. would be to drive it. And, you know, unfortunately, we're just saddled with a lot of real estate that's in the way and a lot of curves you got to put in the railway track. So we're not going to see high speed trains anytime soon. But uh, uh, and, and, and as a result, these demographics and these these challenges are going to be different from place to place. Yes. So yes. this blend of NMC and LFP technologies and whatever else comes next down the down the way. But, uh, uh, you know, we in Nano One, we recognize that there that, that these these are strategic imperatives, and we're we're planting our foot very uh, very firmly in both areas. We're very excited about LFP. We're very bullish on it, um, but we also believe that uh, that there's a, a big room for improvement on the NMC front. If you can improve the durability and the cyclability, that's actually the axis that'll uh, that'll be a big game changer. I know. In the last two or three weeks, we've seen announcements that. Uh, Volkswagen is going to build, uh, LG is going to build for Volkswagen in Georgia, a, a battery factory to supply the new Volkswagen electric vehicle factory in Tennessee, the new edition. And yeah. General Motors just announced the last couple of days they're building, LG again, is building an, a um, battery factory in Ohio. And today I saw uh, in the Detroit a newspaper, so it must be true that General Motors is 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 going to build a battery factory here in the Det- in in the city of Detroit. So I'm wondering, have you uh, had any inquiries from them uh, from LG, for example, about using your L- uh, your cathode process in in some of their batteries? Well, of course, I can never tell anyone about the specific conversations we're having with people, okay. other than the ones we previously announced. But certainly, we're, we already have, we have a partnership with Volkswagen, and, okay. and we and we have a partnership with another major uh, a global automotive OEM that's undisclosed at this point. Okay, and we are pretty much talking to the top uh, four out of five global uh, automotive OEMs, the top producers. Yeah, in the- and, and I didn't. I didn't mean to limit you to LFP. I know you're looking at no, no, the and that's, other and that's, cathodes. That's almost strictly NMC. So mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. those are NMC conversations. Okay. And, and the reason um, uh, that people are talking to us is because these uh, by making these single crystals, these very crystalline powders that we make that are less susceptible to the to degradation. Um, in the assembly of the battery and in the cycling of the battery, we can make them longer lasting. If you make them longer lasting, and the guys designing the battery packs, which would be your VWs and your GMs of the world, um, they are not as constrained. And if they're not as constrained, that means they can actually squeeze more, uh, squeeze more capacity out of the battery and thereby get more range out of exactly the same amount of materials. Mm-hmm. And that's really the holy grail. If you can improve the durability, you can then actually squeeze more range out of the same amount of materials. And then we're not just improving the cathode. All of a sudden, we're getting more out of the anode and the copper and the aluminum foil and the electrolyte and everything else in the battery. And then there's tremendous value that we can bring to the table. Uh, I have a feeling that if General Motors isn't talking to you, they will be soon. They announced today that the Escalade, the largest vehicle they made, which is basically a bus for human, for you know human beings, is yeah. going to be electric in 2023. They're introduced. It'll be the first Cadillac electric vehicle they introduced. The gigantic escalator, and, oh, and anybody's see. going to move that three three tons of stuff around. It's going to be a very sturdy, long life battery. So, yes. uh, yeah, okay. I'm, ho- I'm hoping your phone is ringing from them. Uh, Dan, thank you very much for this very enlightening talk, and I I look forward to hearing from you as as your company progresses. I'm I think you're a winner. Thank you. Well, I really I appreciate your uh, your support and your interest in the company, and certainly there's way more to talk about. I, I could feel the questions building up there, so thank you very much for your time.